Yeah, so hello everyone. Um, my name is Albert. I work as a research scientist at Meta, uh, working on generative models. Uh, I know that Xavi gave yesterday uh, a high level introduction of generative models. Uh, today on this talk, we are gonna focus on the state of the art, which is diffusion models. These models are extremely new. Uh, they got popular last year. And since then they've proved like incredible results. Uh, there's a lot of people working on them. And I would say like they are improving almost weekly. Uh, but yeah, the rules are way, way far beyond what was the previous state of the art that was GANs. Um, so yeah, uh, first of all, I wanna just acknowledge uh, these people. Uh, most of the slides I'm gonna be using uh, were created by them, so, so thanks for that. And a small disclaimer is that all images uh, in this presentation were generated with public models that are available to everyone. So, okay, uh, I just wrote this slide to introduce a bit and motivate a bit the talk. Um, so the idea for today is to build uh, intuition on the foundations, on the fundamentals of diffusion models. So basically, um, how they operate, what's the math behind them. Um, and for that, we're gonna mainly focus on text to image generation. So text to image means that a model receives text as input and then spits out an image in return. Um, this is the, the most basic model there is. And then on top of that, once you understand that, you can start building any other model. So once you know text to image, you can start moving to image to image or uh, text to video, video to video, and all the combinations possible. Um, at the end of the day, all these other applications are just small reformulations um, from these text to image models. So every time I show images, I'm gonna add on the bottom uh, the text from that was used to generate these images. So in this case, um, I'm showing like two groups. One is this food one. Uh, the prom is quite long. Uh, so it's basically, yeah, commercial photography of a powerful explosion of strawberry, blah, 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 blah. So that's what the, the, what the model gets. And then it spits out this image. And then on the second group, um, it's this funny idea of just asking the model for um, selfies of actors on, on movie sets. Uh, and then here the problem is, is quite simpler. So we just a uh, hyperrealistic GoPro selfie of whatever of these actors on the whatever of these movies set, and then just the the um, the screen size for for for, for each of the pictures. Um, so as you can see, they are quite good, um, and and again they are getting better and better and better. I would say the main properties that make them good is how consistent they are in terms of structures. So, um, sorry, can I, yeah. In terms of structure, so you can see here like patterns of like all these lines, uh, they are consistent across the image. Also there's consistency in like long distance pixels. So the, la the sun is here and then the light is properly handled here. Also the light is properly handled in the face. Um, so there's consistency around the image, which is something that um, most other models lack. And then of course also the amount of details, right? So you, we can see like high details on the hair here or on like some really complex textures or, or particles in, in this image. Okay, so um, the outline of the talk today. So we are gonna start with the very basic uh, model. So the foundation model, uh, this is what they are called denoising diffusion models or DDPM. Uh, basically here, we're gonna see just the math behind them and then how to train and how to sample them. And then we're gonna see for like how we can move away from this representation and sample faster uh, with ODE solvers. And I think this is particularly interesting for those people that I'm, I'm sure here, there's a lot of people with a strong background on differentiable equations, uh, then yeah, I think the second part, I'm sure that many of you could contribute on the state of the art. And, and then um, I'm just gonna recap and, and give a brief summary of, of everything. So let's just start with the basics. Again, here, we're just gonna see the, the model, how it works, 
how to train, how to sample, and then uh, we're gonna see how to sample faster with all these samples. So um, there's two main um, diffusion processes on, on diffusion models. The first one is the, dif the forward diffusion process. So basically, given an image, uh, forward diffusion process, the only thing that it does is, is perturbating the image at each iteration. Okay, so it keeps adding more and more and more noise until you converge to pure noise. And by pure noise, I mean like just a normal distribution of, of zero mean and, and one for, for um, the variance. And so these are a pretty straightforward process, right? It's just a digit iteration. You add some um, Gaussian noise, and that's basically it. The reverse denoising process, it's actually what we are interested on, which is this idea that you can go from noise and then you can keep denoising that noise. So you're like removing noise from the original noise until you get into your data distribution space. Uh, so in this case, like real images. So if we are able to learn a model that can do such reverse denoising process, we'll be able to generate images like the ones I was showing before, right? So we start just from uh, sample noise, we condition on text, and then we keep denoising that original noise until we get uh, real images or basically matrices that look the same as, as from the uh, original data distribution. So let's see more in details each of these uh, steps. So each of these uh, process, sorry. So for the forward diffusion process, as I was saying, it's quite straightforward. Um, we're just adding noise at each step. Another way of seeing it is that to generate the noise, uh, sorry, to generate the image at the current step, um, we can, given the, the previous step, we can just use a normal distribution, okay? So the, the new image is gonna be basically like a rescaling of the mean of the previous image, and then we're gonna add some noise. This beta is just a value that it's very close to zero. So this initial uh, scaling it's just gonna be really close to one. So basically what we're doing is just we're scaling a bit down the mean of the image, and then we're adding some noise into it. And also this beta is designed such that at the step T, so it's at the really last step, um, it's gonna have value of one. Okay, so it starts from a value close to zero and it ends at value one so that we can uh, make sure that at the end of the process, we have a uh, noise that it comes from a normal distribution with zero mean and identity variance. Okay, so this is quite straightforward. We're just uh, generating new images based on rescaling and adding some noise. Uh, so we can do this step by step, okay? Uh, but in practice, it's not that useful to having to loop through all the T's to get to your actual T. Uh, instead, it's way better if we can just like skip uh, the intermediate steps and just go directly to any given time step. So because each of the small uh, time steps is uh, Gaussian, we can just redefine also a diffusion kernel. Uh, so basically, we can just define this uh, arbiter variable. And then this is the diffusion kernel. So basically, we can know the distribution of any xt given the original x0. Okay, And again, it's quite straightforward. It's just a rescaling of the mean and then adding noise depending on the, the t that you are. So the larger the t, the more noise you're going to be injecting. Then, because we know this distribution, um, we can just sample out of it. It's just a normal distribution. So um, we can use the reparameterization trick. So if we want to generate an image at x4, we just take x0, scale it, and then add some noise based on, uh, on a sampled noise from a normal distribution, right? Uh, so we can generate infinite amount of images at xt given an original image. So this is quite straightforward what we've seen, right? It's just some um, tools that we are going to be using later. 
Um, but so far we've seen like this diffusion kernel, right? So how to get xt given x0, but what about the marginals, right? So what about the distribution at each time step? Uh, so I don't want to uh, add too much math as I don't want people getting confused. So uh, I'm just gonna keep as high level as I can all the time. Um, so this is basically how the distributions would look across this, right? So this is our original data distribution. And as we keep noising it, uh, we start smoothing it, right? So we have all the modes in our data distribution that because we're converging to a normal distribution, they are getting smoother and smoother and smoother until we lose all of them. And it's just pure noise. Um, of course, the thing here is that we don't have access to these distributions in practice, right? Because uh, X0 is basically going to be all the possible images uh, that we could get. Um, and then this is intractable to know how the distribution of all possible images that could exist uh, looks like. Um, so how does the reverse process work then, right? So if we knew exactly how these distributions look like, we could just sample directly from it, right? If, if we knew how the distribution of all images looks like, which is this QX0, then we could just sample out of it. But that's not the case. So what we need to do is this, um, uh, the like backward uh, stages, right? Where we start from noise. And then if we have a function that is basically this true uh, denoising distribution, we can just sample out of Gaussian, that is easy. And then we can keep denoising this sample across time until we get a real image. But there's a problem with this, um, which is that this is intractable also. So um, we cannot know how this true denoising distribution looks. Okay, We cannot know how to go from noise and then start removing noise, removing noise, removing noise until we get to a real image. And the reason why this is intractable is because we can also express it this way. Right. And again, we get back to this problem where we cannot know how the marginals look like, right? We cannot know how all the distributions of, uh, sorry, the distribution of how all images look like at each denoising stage. So in practice, what we end up doing is, okay, we can not know it, it's intractable, but we can approximate it with a learn function. So the idea is that instead of trying to figure out how this queue looks like that is interactable, instead we're gonna learn another function p that it's gonna try to approximate as close as possible to this um, perfect queue. Again, this queue is is this idea of keep denoising it, right? So it's the kernel that it's gonna tell you how the new image is less noisy given the the original image. Uh, well, originally, but sorry, or a previous step. So we know that each of these functions, it's a normal distribution, right? Um, because we are noising with normals, then the denoising is also a normal process. Uh, we also know the, the variance at each step, right? We know how much noise we add at each step because we define that. So really the only thing that it's left to know exactly is the actual mean of this normal distribution. And this is what we learn. So we learn a function that it's gonna approximate the mean of the denoising the, uh, the, uh, process that we know that it's a normal. Um, so let's look a bit this into more detail what I just explained. So we want to start from noise. This is xt. So this is the last step. And we want to keep denoising, 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 denoising until we get to real images, right? That's a generative process, going from noise to samples that are from the original data distribution. And each step, we know that it's Gaussian, right? It's this function that we want to approximate. So we can just sample from Gaussian noise and then this is the function that I was just talking about, right? So this is the denoising uh, function. 
So given the x at the previous stage, I can estimate now the, the new one, right? So if I'm, for example, here, I'm going to estimate which is the next one, and what's the next one, and what's the next one, and what's the next one. So I'm removing noise at each step. In practice, we could just learn a function that just gives you directly the mean. But in practice, um, if you just derive the reparameterization trick, you will arrive to this uh, formulation. And then in practice, it's more stable and easier also for the math. If you, instead of just trying to learn the mean, you learn this noise, OK? So it's just the same. Uh, it's just that this way, it's easier in practice. Uh, so everyone, what ends up doing is parameterizing the mean in this manner. Again, this equation just comes from deriving this uh, reparameterization trick and just learning the noise. Okay, So in practice, this is how it looks like. You just uh, generate an xt given an x0. This x0 is just from your data set, right? So you have a large data set of images. Um, you sample one of these images for, from your data set. Uh, that's going to be x0. Then we noise it. So this is going to be xt. Again, this is the representation trick that we already saw. So we are just scaling that initial image that we've sampled. And then we're adding some noise based on the time step t. And then the goal for this neural network is to estimate the noise that was used to generate this image. Um, so it gets really easy. And also, suddenly, it's like a supervised loss, right? It's not like GANs that your loss is another network, and then you have the um, both need to be trained together. And then that introduces a lot of, of instabilities, right? Because maybe the discriminator will get too good or too bad, and then the entire thing collapses. Here, the loss is way easier. I just add noise to an image, and then I learn to predict the noise I added to that image. It's as simple as that. So this is actually, for those that prefer looking in a more like straightforward, practical manner, this is the algorithms. <laughs> Um, that uh, you can just use to train and, and sample. Um, it's quite straightforward, right? It, it's impressive that something this simple was that extremely good. So again, for training, you just have a large data set of images. These are real images from everything that you want in the world. And then you just sample out of that data set. So you have one image. Then you sample a t, let's say three, and you sample some noise. So you first uh, generate the xt, right? So in this case, it would be this image. So all this is just this image. Then we would input that into a neural network, say that this image comes from step three. And then the function or the output of this a neural network is the the noise, the estimated noise. Okay, so this network is going to try to estimate the noise, and then we just compare it against the noise that was used to generate uh, that noise image, and you just keep doing this for a long time. Uh, these models take a really long time to train. Um, this t can be up to one thousand normally. So um, yeah, you need to to learn how to denoise at several uh, stages. Um, thousand in general. So that takes a long time. Um, and normally many GPUs. Uh, so most researchers, they don't train from scratch uh, because only like big universities or big companies with a lot of resources can train from scratch. But most of the research is once you have a trained model, what do you do next? So how do you sample fast? How do you sample better? Or how do you apply it to different problems? Uh, given a pre-trained model. Um, so for sampling, the most uh, naive way, that is the way we've seen so far, it's just that you start from pure noise. Now you have this train network already. And then you're going to go from the very end to the very beginning. Again, this is like around 1,000, let's say. 
And then basically we need to estimate the image at the next step, right? So at each step, we're gonna estimate one image that is less noisy than the original one, that it was pure noise. And yes, we are just sampling from this uh, reverse denoising distribution, right? So this is basically the mean, and then we're just adding some noise on top of it. So we are imitating the forward pass, but in reverse uh, using our neural network. Uh, so this is uh, okay. So this is really all you need um, to get to generate these really good images. Again, the model for both of them, for for both groups of images, is the same. It's not like one model was trained to generate selfies, one model was generated to generate food. It's like one model that can generate anything you want, um, and even things that are very far away from the images it's been looking at, right? You could ask for like a unicorn riding a bicycle, jumping through a fence or whatever, and it, it will still generate it. So it's really good at understanding uh, how images look like, and then just being able to sample from, from that distribution. Um, so far, we've been talking about like this neural network that estimates the noise, that at the end of the day, it's our model. Um, but I haven't explained how does that look like. And it's really simple. Uh, it's just a unit um, that you input the noise image. You also input the time you are in, and then it's just going to emit the noise. Uh, this unit is, is quite big in general, uh, because at the end of the day, you need to understand that it's encoding how things look like in these weights, right? So if, if it can generate cats, dogs, horses, unicorns, uh, anything, um, all that information on how objects are looking like, or most of it, it's being stored in these uh, weights of the unit. So these units can get really big. Um, nowadays, um, they can get, I mean, they can get as big as, uh, as you want. But in general, they are around like 20 gigabytes networks uh, around that. Uh, and then, of course, the more parameters you have, uh, the better these models will work because they can just store more information in their weights. So they, um, also the difference between, or one of the key things that makes these units work really good is having attention blocks at each step. So for those of you that don't know what attention blocks are, it's just this idea that instead of just having 2D convolutions uh, with a fixed kernel, uh, instead, you can have these attention blocks. You can see them as convolutions with infinite kernel size. So it's basically a convolution that instead of just locally seeing the pixels around it, it can look at the entire image. Uh, and then um, that makes it way better in the sense that uh, in order to generate, for example, pixels that are on the left corner, maybe you need information from the top right corner. Um, and with just like local kernels, it, it, it's harder to get this sort of information. You only get it once you're really down to the to the smaller sizes. But um, with these attention blocks, you just can attend or can look at everything on the image. So that becomes way easier. OK, so um, are there any questions so far? Um, so basically, now what we've seen is really like all the necessary basics on denoising different models. Uh, in practice, everyone trains like this, uh, as we've seen. So all models are trained with DDPM. Um, that's what works the best. But now we're going to see in a second stage that instead of seeing these models as denoising models, you can redefine them using differentiable equations. And once you are in this realm of differential equations, then you can use all your tool set from differential equations. And one of these key tools is the solvers. So we're going to see that we can highly speed up this uh, generative process with ODE solvers. Uh, mainly, we were seeing now that you would need to do 1,000 steps to generate an image. That's 1,000 forward passes of a really big unit. Um, instead, with this, using all these solvers, you can get down to 20 steps instead of 1,000. Um, and this is what I was saying at the beginning. Um, once 
you find out or you understand that you can represent all diffusion models as differentiable equations. Someone with really strong background um, on math um, has a lot to offer to the community. Um, so there's a lot of people from math jumping in uh, to help and making things better. Um, so once you have a trained model, this is, is allowing you to, to get better images in a faster way, um, which is really nice. So let's see how that works. Um, so remember from the, well, before we jump, is there any questions um, from the first part? Otherwise I can just jump to the second. Ah, okay, I see some questions. Uh, so why there is such problem with generating hands? Yes, so hands it's tricky because it's a structure that it's pretty well defined in general, in the general case, you'll have five fingers. And then of course you can have out of that distribution. But um, the main thing is that it's a really defined structure in very small amount of pixels. So you really need to nail it down and you don't have that many pixels to do it good. Um, this is why many models, um, they will start generating like three fingers, four fingers, um, or even like more fingers, like seven fingers. Uh, it's hard to nail down. But the thing is that the new models are, are almost fixing it. Uh, I would say like there's not many that, uh, with the state of the art models, uh, it's almost a fixed problem, I would say. Uh, the main trick is just adding, we will see now, but it's just adding more, more features into how many, like, okay, so each pixel on the image is represented by amount of features, right? So if you increase that amount of features, then you have more power of expressivity per pixel. So things that occupy a small amount of pixels, if you give them more representation power, um, they are going to work better. If it's a small amount of pixels and you have a small representation per pixel, then you don't have much to do there. Uh, but just like doing this trick of extending uh, the amount of parameters per pixel, then that, that works fine most of, most of the cases. So how different models can be used in model robot applications? Um, okay, so there's different options um, for this, this specific case of, of model applications. So one way is just to um, like generate um, like simulation, for example. Uh, there's uh, many, I mean, I, I know that um, Uber was using uh, technologies like this. Uh, I don't know if Tesla is also using, but basically if you have, if you know how images look like, you can transform images uh, that don't look that good to images that look really good. Um, so I know that they were training a lot of um, uh, these autopilots um, with simulated images that then they are improved with, um, with diffusion models. Also, you can change the conditions, right? So uh, you can change that into images that look like is it raining or it's snowing or like many other things. Also for, for the, the, the specific case of robotics, I've seen um, also some papers related to uh, manipulation. Like you wanna manipulate a scene um, and then you can use diffusion models as a way to generate the state of that scene and how you wanna move it. And then you can plan with with those those generated images. Um, so yeah, I would say that generative models are are just this tool that allows you to go from noise to whatever data distribution you want. Here in this talk, we are mainly focused on images, as I know there's uh, many people interested in, in in vision, but this could be anything. It could be um, sensors, uh, the, the distribution from sensors data that you want to learn, and then you want to sample out of that distribution. Uh, and for example, know what's the likelihood of that distribution, or that, that sample. Um, or it could be music, it could be anything really. Um, it just X, right? And this, this X can be anything. 
Okay, so we can skip to the next one. Um, so as I was saying, um, so far we've seen this as as denoising um, kernels, right? So it's the idea of you you just keep noising or denoising your samples, and then you get there. Um, but uh, actually, in this paper, they show that if you just consider the limit and you do many steps, you you reach basically a stochastic differentiable equation. Okay, so you take uh, the diffusion kernel, go to the limit, and with many steps, and then you converge to this equation that looks the exact same as stochastic differential equations, meaning that you can represent everything we've, we've seen, so both forward and backward, with differential equations. Uh, I know that not everyone probably here remembers differential equations, so uh, I'm just going to do one slide on like high level of differential equation, just if someone is not uh, remembering much about it. Uh, again, it's just one slide. Um, so basically, differentiable equation is this idea that maybe you have functions for which you don't have a closed from solution. Uh, and instead, you only have a function that it's going to tell you like an update rule, right? So how a function evolves through time. Uh, so that's why uh, we have this tool called differential equations. Uh, so basically, this function is telling you how to update at each time t. Um, so if you want to reach uh, x in another ideal solution, you just start from an original point, and then you just uh, do the integral through this set of small uh, steps. Okay, um, So this is like the path you trace, right? You start from this x0, and then at each step, this function is telling you, OK, this is the update rule on how you need to move next. Um, in most cases, we don't have an analytical solution for it. And then we can just move to iterative numerical solutions, where it's, it's again, the same. The only thing is that you are uh, linearizing your function in locally. Uh, and then there's stochastic differential equations, which is just the same as ordinary differential equations, but these ones are stochastic. So you are also introducing noise into the update rule. Um, so because they are stochastic, now if you start from the same point, uh, you can see that we are adding noise at each step. Then you will end up at different uh, positions. Um, so these are necessary mainly for uh, um, yeah models that require or have noise in them. So you need to somehow parameterize that noise. Uh, in practice, for uh, iterative numerical solutions, it's the same as ordinary ones, but we're just adding this noise um, at each step, um, scaled by, by some factor. And again, so we've seen like this function here of stochastic differential equations. Uh, it's this one, and we can express our uh, diffusion process with this same equation. Um, so this is how it looks in practice. We can do both the forward and the backward process um, as a differentiable uh, equation. So we imagine that we have, again, this um, data distribution. This you can see it as all images uh, that look as an image. Um, and then this is the noise. Right, so we can just noise, or we can denoise, um, and mainly what we are interested on is on the backward process, right? So starting from noise and then being able to generate from that distribution. And again, as I was saying before, these don't have to be real images. This could be the distribution of your noise on your sensors or on your joints or whatever error you have on your paths. Uh, it can be any distribution. And of course, we don't have access to this distribution, right? Because it's intractable. And then what diffusion models are giving you is just a way to sample out of that distribution. So again, forward process is just stochastic uh, differential equations. Um, the two terms that we saw before, right? So you have the drift term. This is, if you, if you just 
uh, don't think about this beta for a moment. This is just pushing you towards the mode of the of the normal noise, right? So if you are uh, in the positive, it's gonna move you towards negative. If you're in the negative zone, you're gonna be pushed towards the, the positive. So we're just moving you towards the mean. And then the diffusion term is the one adding you noise so that you don't end up just in the mean, but you are you you can uh, you can move uh, on it. Um, so this is the forward diffusion. This is always what's easier to do. But what about the reverse direction, right? So how do we start from noise and then learn a function? Then it's going to tell us an update rule to go back until uh, we reach our desired distribution. So there's a very classic result from these papers, so 1982, that if you have a forward diffusion stochastic differentiable equation like this, and then the, the reverse generative or the reverse diffusion, it's just this equation. Okay, this is like classic known. Uh, you can read more about this in, in this paper. Um, so basically, we have all the terms as the forward diffusion, so we know all of it. Um, the only thing that is unknown is this score function. So this score function is just the log of, of QT. So it's just the log of the marginal distribution, and it's the gradient of that. So it's the gradient of the, of the log uh, marginal distribution. Um, and again, uh, so how do we learn this, right? Um, we have we know everything. The only thing that we don't know is this score function. Um, so do we have it? Like how how do we get there? Um, so the main problem is that. We already said that before, right? So this distribution is non-tractable because we cannot know how the distribution for all images or for all your sensors, for all your paths, whatever you have under your distribution, um, how does that look? Um, we, we just don't have access to that uh, distribution. So a very naive thing that we could do is just say, okay, Let's just learn a network to estimate that. And then we're sort of done. Um, the problem here is, again, it's intractable. So we don't have access to it. So we can just not learn to imitate that if we don't have access to it, as we don't know what we need to imitate. So another, let's say, also classic paper of, of 2011 um shows this idea that okay if you don't have access to the marginal uh the diffuse kernel is good enough so it's true that we don't have we don't we don't have access to q of xt right we don't have access to that distribution on how xt looks like but we know how to get to xt given x0 right we, we've seen that it's just adding noise to it um and based on this paper, um, then it, it's fine. Um, we're, we're good to go. Um, it, it's good enough approximation. So that's exactly what we do. Um, we just have this, right? This is called uh, of the diffuse data sample. Um, this is, we know how to get there. It's just adding noise to original samples. And then we can train a network to learn that. If you derive this equation, you get to this other equation. And if you remember, this looks exactly as what we saw with TTPM, right? It's just a network that tries to estimate the noise introduced. Um, and this is like a really powerful thing because basically what we're seeing here is that no matter if we think of these units as estimating just like noise or estimating a discord function, um, they, you arrive to the exact same equation. Meaning that no matter if you train with DDPM or you train with 
um, differentiable equations, it's the exact same equation, equation what you arrive to. Um, so this is why everyone just trains with this equation. And then once you have a trained model like this, you can see it as we were seeing it before. So it's just a model that learns and then on at sampling also um, how to denoise. Or you can, think, you can see it as a model from the differentiable equation perspective, as a model that what outputs is no longer how this noise, uh, but it's just a gradient on where to go next, right? It's just a vector field. So the unit is no longer telling you, this is the noise that was introduced to the image. Instead, it's telling you a vector field of, okay, you're here. If you wanna get better looking images, move in this direction, right? So you're in whatever step and then the unit is going to tell, okay, move this way, move that way, move that way. And then uh, following that gradient, you're going to get back to real images. So this is really, really powerful. And in practice, this is what everyone does. So you train with BPM and then you move into this differential equation framework as you can use all these solvers suddenly, right? So we no longer need to do a thousand steps of just denoising, 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 denoising. Now you can see the all diffusion models as you have a unit that encodes the vector field, and then you can use all your tricks from differentiable equations. So you can use all your solvers, all the math you want on, on that framework uh, to speed that up. Um, with DDPM, you will normally do, need to do like a thousand steps. So you'll need to do all the steps. It's, it's a pure Markovian process. You need to go through all the steps. Um, once you move to differential equation framework, um, you can go down to 20 steps. And now there's a lot of, of research on how can you even get lower and lower, lower, lower on, on number of steps. Again, each of these forward steps, it's a forward pass to the unit. So the less steps you do, the, the, the faster you'll go. Um, also in practice, um, we've seen that in theory, you should need a, a stochastic differential equation. In practice, it works better if you use just ordinary differential equations. It's just more stable um, and, and, and it works as well. So everyone uses ordinary differential equations that it's even simpler. So they are not stochastic. It's a pure deterministic process. So here uh, I'm showing this. So you start from whatever noise, and then you're gonna follow the gradients that the unit is telling you uh, until you arrive to your data distribution. Um, so this is quite simple. I mean, it's just a deterministic process. It's just all these, it's the simplest, as, as simple as you can go. Um, again, you can leverage all the literature from SDEs and ODEs. Um, it's, it's a dollar. And also it's a clean mathematical framework. So um, it's no longer like uh, other um, generative models that, that you saw before. Um, this is more cleaner in the sense that it's just a vector field and you are just optimizing through it. Okay. Um, so just a summary of everything we've talked. We started with DDPM. Uh, we saw that this is how you train. Again, you just sample images from your data set, you noise them, and then you learn a function. Then it's gonna tell you what was the noise that you added. This is how everyone trains nowadays also. Uh, so state of the art. Again, this model just came out like last year. Uh, so everything is really new, but still like every week, you'll see many, many, many papers being published in archive weekly um, on, on better ways of, of sampling and so on. So training, still everyone does it this way. And then the most naive way of sampling is just reversing this um, noising process. So instead you denoise at each process, this is a Markovian process. Uh, so given the previous step, you just, learn, uh, you just uh, sample by denoising the, the previous one. Um, this is very slow. So in practice, what everyone does is move away from this formulation at sampling time and just use your favorite uh, differential uh, equations um, solvers to, to, to get them. 
and you can get in 20 steps. Um, 20 steps means that you'll need around eight seconds to generate an image with a naive implementation. Uh, then, of course, uh, with faster, more efficient implementations, you can get to milliseconds. Um, but but still, like the good thing is that if you are able to reduce number of steps, uh, that's linear in time, right? So if you reduce 10x the number of steps that you need, then that's a 10x faster uh, generative model. Um, so this is the last slide just to summarize everything. Um, so we've seen both uh, diffusion models from the discrete time perspective and the continuous time perspective and how we can accelerate sampling uh, using uh, continuous time. Um, take home message, always train with DDPM. That's what everyone does. Again, uh, if you're in a university and you don't have that many resources, probably it's not the best idea to try to train these models. Um, what everyone does is just use pre-trained ones and do research on top of them. So you don't need to train from scratch. Um, all the formulations, all the equations, all the improvements that you want to add uh, can, can be done without having to train from zero and just having some initial weights, right? So you already have retained function that is telling you the vector field. And then it's like, OK, what do I do now with this vector field? How, how I improve the sampling? Um, to sample in practice, most people would use ODE solvers. Also, you, 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 you can like look in YouTube. And you'll see that there's a lot and a lot and a lot of artists that they don't know about math, uh, but they have access to all these diffusion models to generate images, right? Um, so they don't know much what they are changing in these models, but you'll see, I would say, hundreds of videos on YouTube on go to the framework and change the solver for this or change the number of steps, change whatever. Um, they really don't know what they are doing. They are just sort of like trying um, by many, uh, just trying, I would I guess, randomly and, and just coming out with the, the best um, configurations. But as that we know about how the math works and so on, we can actually propose something that makes sense. And it's just not uh, crazy um, formulas to get really nice images. Um, Really interesting research directions that uh, I would say everyone with small amount of GPU resources can do is faster sampling. For this, you only need one GPU, and that, that's basically it. Um, smaller models also. So these models now, are, as I was saying, they are huge. And they were at least 20 gigabytes, I would say, but they can go higher. Um, so yeah, how can can we do something to reduce? Uh, this is really challenging. As, as I was saying, um, more these weights are encoding how things look like. Um, it's true that they use text encoders. So you can, you're you also getting information from these text encoders. But I would guess that also a lot of information of how things look like are, are being stored there in the weights. So it's challenging how to, to, to reduce that. Another thing is video generation. So one thing is to generate one frame, also one image. But once you want to start generating entire videos, so um, that gets more challenging because suddenly everything needs to be temporally consistent. So for example, for what I was saying before on, on going from um, videos that are just like a simulator for uh, mobile robotics and going to things that look more realistic, that's just an easier task because that's video to video. Um, so, uh, but if you want to go from text to video, that's really, really challenging. And nowadays, the state of the art is really bad at video generation. So there's a ton and a ton and a ton of research that can be done there. And the other thing is how to move to 3D generation, right? How do you go from text to 3D assets? Uh, that's also challenging in the sense that suddenly all the 3D needs to be consistent. Uh, I would say that that works way better than video generation nowadays, but still also there's a lot to be done. And I just added here like three other images generating by diffusion model, um, just to show like other things that we haven't seen before. So of course, it's not just 
pure realistic images what you can learn you can learn like styles uh, so here i was asking for a cyberpunk character um also it's not like generative models they just memorize what you've shown them on on, on your uh while training then th there would be no sense on that right like then no one would care about a model that just memorizes the images you've shown um, so I generated this image so that you can see um, something that it's not on your training distribution, right? So it has never seen a master Jedi cat, but still it understands the characteristics of each of the things I'm asking for. And then you can sample out of that because you understand each of the elements and then you can combine. Them. And yes, here is just another one that I think that that's kind of challenging. Um, so this is like more a more abstract uh, image, and then the really challenging thing here is all the reflections, right? So um, now you cannot just generate locally things that look okay, but suddenly you need coherence in in the space direction also. Um, so all the reflections need to be consistent with the with the rest of the image and so on, and that makes it way more challenging. Um, but still, I would say they, they do uh, decent work on it. Um, and, and that's also very interesting. OK, so that's basically all from my side. So now I'm happy to answer any other questions. OK, so I see that there's one uh, on using partial differentiable equations. Yeah, I, I think. Everything really is is possible in the sense that everything is worth trying. Um, I don't think there's anything that is like, oh, this is just way too bad. Um, also, trying these things is really simple, right? And you don't need, you only need like one GPU. That, that that's all you need. Um, so you have your unit that is just giving the vector field, and then just just use any good ideas you you have. Again, this, this is like a really, really, really um, um, powerful uh, field in the sense that there's many uh, people interested in it, uh, many companies, uh, many researchers, and so on. So if you are somehow able to improve results um, with your background on math, then that can have massive, massive, massive um, impact. We were checking, like, there was a paper that came out, like, uh, three months ago, and, and it had already, like, thousands of citations. So it's a really active field, many people looking into it, and any uh, contribution, like, significant contribution to it uh, will have massive, massive impact. Uh, so there's another question. Instead of unit backbone, can transformer be used? for sequence generation. Yeah, definitely. There's a lot of work also using uh, transformers. In practice, unit so far, it's what works the best. Um, so there's a lot of works uh, showing that basically, OK, you can get as good with transformers. But in general, um, they don't improve much. I would say probably the reason is that for transformers to work, they need to be huge. Right, so when you use ChatGPT and all these models, all these are just transformer-based neural networks. Um, but they work by being massive, and these are gigas and gigas of of of, of network. <laughs> um, uh, so I don't. Well, I mean, it's not public how much the ChatGPT transformer is, but it must be way way bigger than 20 gigas. It's like way 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 bigger. Um, Units are normally better when you want to compress the amount of space required. Um, and this is why, I guess, like units currently are, are, are the most used solution. Again, there are some papers using transformers, but no one yet has been able to prove that if you move to transformers, then suddenly you get super good results. Um, no. Um, are uh, SEM models? ever preferred over DDPM. Um, so DDPM, it's it's the most basic one. Um, 
it's just that someone made it work. So also there's a lot of, one of the tricky things with these models is making them work. So the math is some sort of simple, but then making it work, it's, it's another whole thing. Uh, because there's crazy amount of small details, even on, on the hardware side, right? Once you need many GPUs, you need to take care of all the gradients being consistent and nothing like destroying the rest. I mean, it gets tricky once you scale to, to really big models and really big data sets. So DDPM was the first to show that it can work. Uh, so in the paper of DDPM, they, they presented like the first mo model that actually was looking really good. And then from then, many, 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 many other models have came, right? Once DDPM established the base, everyone now is branching out into many ideas. Um, and again, I think all of them are good ideas to, to, to study and, and, and see how far they can get you. Um, there's now also something that is getting popular that is flow matching models. Um, you can basically see them as diffusion models also, uh, but they use normalizing flows. But, but still, they have not been able to prove that they work better. So again, it, it's just like everyone's starting from this very basic DDPM. And then, yeah, all possibilities are, are good to explore. Um, but so far, what I've presented is what works the best. OK, so I think we're exactly on time. Um, so yeah, thanks, everyone.